This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 73. Coming up on Space Time. New evidence shows the space station leak was man-made. Osiris Rex spots one of the most dangerous asteroids known. And the supermassive black hole discovered in an ultra-compact dwarf. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. It's been revealed that the hole found in the hull of a Russian Soyuz spacecraft, which allowed atmosphere from the International Space Station to vent into space, was made by a drill. It had been assumed that the hole, found in the orbital module of the Soyuz MS-09 spacecraft, was caused by either micrometeoroid or space junk impact. However, new images of the damage clearly show it to be a drill hole, possibly caused by an inertia employee who wasn't paying attention to what they were doing when the spacecraft was being manufactured. Whoever drilled the hole then covered it up with some tape, and the damage somehow got through Russian quality control checks. As Howard Wolowitz would say, who'd expect such a thing from the people who brought you Chernobyl? The Russian Federal Space Agency at Oscosmos says the incident may have occurred during the final assembly or even testing of the Soyuz MS-09. The Soyuz arrived on station in June and is now slated to return to Earth in December. The Expedition 5657 crew aboard the orbiting outpost weren't informed about the leak when Russian mission managers first detected the dropping cabin pressure. Instead, they were only told of the problem after completion of their allocated sleep cycle. Mission control centres in both Houston and Moscow worked together with the crew to close hatches between the space station's numerous segments to try and isolate the location of the leak. It was eventually traced to what was originally thought to be a pair of holes in the hull of the orbital module of the Soyuz MS-09 spacecraft, which is docked to the Rosvet module on the Russian segment of the space station. Closer examination has since found that it's only a single hole with some associated scratch marks. The crew used an epoxy to seal the hole, which was originally described as a micro-fissure. Mission managers say cabin pressure's holding steady following the repairs. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Dr Fred Watson. An air leak on the International Space Station, which sounds rather serious, but there's a sinister side to this, perhaps, with allegations of sabotage. Good grief. This uh, rather shocking story of an air leak on the ISS, that's bad enough, but sabotage? Isn't it interesting? So uh, when this story broke last week, Andrew, um, it was being sort of advertised as due to a micrometeorite impact. Mm -hmm. Uh, Micrometeorites, of course, are little bits of space dust. Uh, the, The reason why they're dangerous is because they travel so fast. So natural space dust. In addition to that risk, uh, astronauts up there face the risk from space junk too, which we've talked about before many times. We've all seen that picture of a a shard of glass missing from the windscreen of the space shuttle because of a fleck of paint that hit it at eight kilometres per second. No, it's just staggering, isn't it? So uh, natural and uh, artificially made space junk are are an ongoing hazard with the International Space Station. And when that story broke last week... um, about the leak in the International Space Station, that was what it was assumed to be. But further examination has indicated that this hole was not actually caused by a micrometeorite. It was actually caused by a drill, that there is a hole drilled in the outer fabric of not the space station itself, but the Russian Soyuz module, which is docked with the space station. And in fact, it's not even the the manned capsule of the Soyuz module, the the bit that brings uh, astronauts back to Earth, the the re-entry module. It's something that we would probably call the service module. It's a a module that doesn't have people living in it, but it is pressurised and there is access to it. Uh, That has a hole in it. And the Evidence is, well, you know, people can clearly see when you examine a hole what's made it uh, in terms of the difference between a drill and a micrometeorite. They have quite different structure around the edge of the hole. But there's more of a smoking gun still with this. And that is that, you know, I'm sure, as I do, if you try and drill a hole in a piece of metal without putting a dint with a centre punch in it to start with, Mm. the drill just wanders all over the place. Oh, that's Uh, what's happened and leaves marks, and those marks are there. So uh, whoever's done this 
had just sort of poked a drill at the wall and started it going. And it's wandered off and, and marked the metal before it has actually uh, started to drill the hole. So are we so, assuming this happened on the ground before the thing was attached or are we talking somebody on board? Well, there's two options. Either somebody doing it on the ground or somebody doing it on board. <laughs> wow. uh, and and we don't know the answer to that. It, it is very interesting. I mean, um, you can bet your life we will find the answer, I'm sure, because this kind of thing prompts detective work of the most intense kind, all of which at the moment, it has to be said, is being done by the Russians, because this is a Russian, you know, it's a piece of Russian property that's actually got the hole in it. Mm. It is possible that it was a mistake that somebody made on the ground when the spacecraft was being built. It may have been an error that was made and then sealed up and just to basically cover it up. And then maybe that ceiling broke away when it was, um, you know, exposed to the vacuum of space and because the the fact was that we thought it was a micrometeorite so this leak occurred relatively suddenly it wasn't something that had just you know built up over time it occurred relatively suddenly as though a micrometeorite had hit it but if it was a piece of artificial sealant that had been put on it and had come away then that would have the same the same effect it was of course just to reassure everybody it was plugged very quickly. In fact, um, one of the astronauts, I think it was the German astronaut who's on board at the moment, stuck his finger on it and that <laughs> essentially blocked it up. He and was then Dutch, they... wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, it had to be, that's right. <laughs> oh, thank you, well done there. It, so that blocked it up and then they put some sticky tape or something over it. They, they <laughs> sealed it up fairly effectively. A multi-billion dollar spacecraft and they've gone to the stationary store to fix it. Yeah, you, you a bit of gaffer tape or something like that. <laughs> oh, that's stuff. good stuff. Well, that it is, is we do it all the time in the world of astronomy, but yeah. we're not you know, relying on it to let us breathe. So I suppose because we don't know how it happened, we don't know when it happened. So we we don't know how long the hole existed. That's correct. There is a comment that's been made by one of the Russian who's had experience in space. His name is Alexander Zelenyakov. I hope that's the correct pronunciation. He's a former space industry engineer and author and he told the TASS news agency in Russia that drilling the hole in zero gravity would be nearly impossible in that part of the spacecraft. Ah. Uh, and that, yes, you know, that's a, a good suggestion. But of course, everybody questions why the cosmonauts would do it. There has been a theory advanced that a cosmonaut might do this because, because he or she was psychologically disturbed and wanted to force an early transfer back to, to Earth. But that's not the best way to do that. I mean, I think if you were really in trouble, you would fess up to that and, and actually have a trip back to Earth with everything well understood and intact rather than drilling a hole in the space station. Yeah, I've, so seen, I've seen stick. NASA's actually published uh, photographs of the, yeah. of the hole on Twitter and probably other social media platforms it is clearly a drill hole it is That's um, right. there's no <laughs> denying it and i can see the scorch marks that you mention where the drill has slipped so yeah. whoever drilled it intended to drill it yep um there's no sort of indication that it could have been a sort of a punch through from another surface that accidentally drilled through that's that's correct so that's um, one wonders why yeah. uh, maybe it was a uh, just a mistake they they didn't you know they drilled the hole thinking something was going to be put there and ended up not happening or who knows it's yeah it's a mystery putting a coat hooker in or something like that yeah. you know? <laughs> no, i think um i think the, <laughs> the coat hanger uh, would work well on the iss it would on the iss that's right um i yeah a mistake is certainly a possibility and maybe you know if somebody had made a mistake and they were just too scared to fess up to it and then blocked it up best they could and then it's come away that might be the answer that's dr fred watson an astronomer with the department of science speaking with andrew dunkley on our sister program space nuts and this is space time i'm stuart gary Okay, let's take a break from our show now for a word from our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. I know that you love learning about the mysteries of the universe just as much as I do, which is why I know you'll love The Great Courses Plus. With The Great Courses Plus, you get unlimited access to fascinating audio and video lectures on thousands of topics presented by award-winning professors and experts. You can dive deeper into string theory, find out about dark matter, dwarf planets, or explore other interests like history or photography. New courses are being added all the time, so there's always something new to learn. 
You can enjoy watching or listening to these lectures anywhere, anytime with the Great Courses Plus app, available in both iOS and Android. I've just been listening to Black Holes, Tides and Curved Space Time, Understanding Gravity. It's presented by the brilliant Professor of Physics, Dr. Benjamin Shoemaker. It's just great the way he takes complicated theories and breaks them down into easy-to-understand language. And each lecture runs for about 30 minutes, so it's not too taxing on the brain. And you'll come away with a better understanding of how gravity affects our lives and the science we see in so many ways. Or enjoy any of their 10,000 other lectures with our special offer, a free trial with unlimited access to their entire library. So get started now by signing up with our special URL. That way they know you came from us and you'll be helping our show. Sign up for your free trial at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And of course, we'll include the URL in the show notes, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And now, back to our show. You're listening to Space Time, Space Time with Stuart Gary. After a journey lasting almost two years, NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has finally caught sight of its target, the near-Earth asteroid Bennu, and is now beginning its final approach. The probe will arrive at Bennu on December 3rd. OSIRIS-REx is NASA's first mission to a near-Earth asteroid. It'll survey the surface, collect samples, and deliver those samples back to Earth. The name OSIRIS-REx stands for Origin Spectral Interpretation Resource Identification Security Regolith Explorer. The 2,110kg spacecraft has travelled approximately 1.8 billion kilometres since its launch aboard an Atlas V rocket from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida back on September 8, 2016. OSIRIS-REx principal investigator Professor Dante Loretta from the University of Arizona says now that the spacecraft's close enough to observe Bennu, the mission team will spend the next few months learning as much as they can about the asteroid's size, shape, surface features and surroundings. To boost itself into Bennu's orbital plane, OSIRIS-REx performed a slingshot maneuver or gravity assist around the Earth 11 months ago. The spacecraft's now flying at almost 52,000 kilometres per hour relative to the Earth, and is closing in on Bennu at around 2,000 kilometres per hour relative to the asteroid. The probe's polycam camera obtained its first images of Bennu at a distance of 2.3 million kilometres. Polycam is so named because it's polyfunctional. It has two jobs. One is a long-range acquisition camera, and the second is a reconnaissance camera once the spacecraft gets close to Bennu. Obtaining the first visual target of the asteroid has been meticulously planned ever since the early development of the mission. Almost every action the spacecraft executes is preceded by a nine-week planning process. That consists of program development and multiple tests and reviews, before the codes finally uploaded to the spacecraft by way of NASA's Deep Space Communications Network. And once the spacecraft's begun executing a command, there's very little if any ground communications involved. In fact, when OSIRIS-REx reached the predetermined position on its trajectory and turned on its camera for a series of 30 exposures, the asteroid was exactly where mission planners had predicted it would be weeks earlier. Right now, Bennu just looks like a star, a single-point light source. But all that will have dramatically changed by mid-November, when mission managers begin detailed observations looking for craters and boulders. As OSIRIS-REx approaches the asteroid, the spacecraft will use its science instruments to gather more information about Bennu to prepare for its arrival. In addition to the camera suite, the spacecraft's science payload also includes a thermal spectrometer, a visible and infrared spectrometer, a laser altimeter, and an X-ray spectrometer. During the mission's approach phase, OSIRIS-REx will observe the area around the asteroid, searching for dust plumes and natural satellites, and studying Bennu's light and spectral properties. It'll also execute a series of four asteroid approach maneuvers beginning on October 1st, slowing the spacecraft in order to match Bennu's speed and trajectory. It'll then jettison the protective cover over the spacecraft's sampling arm in mid-October and extend and image the arm for the first time in flight. By late October, OSIRIS-REx will use its science instruments to reveal the asteroid's overall shape, and it should begin detecting Bennu's surface features by mid-November. After its arrival at Bennu, OSIRIS-REx will spend the first month performing flybys of Bennu's North Pole, Equator and South Pole, at distances ranging from 7 to 19 kilometres above the asteroid's surface. 
These manoeuvres will also allow the first direct measurements of Bennu's mass, as well as close-up observations of its surface. And these trajectories will also provide mission navigation team members with experience navigating near the asteroid. You see, Bennu's low gravity will provide a unique challenge for the mission. At just 492 metres in diameter, Bennu will be the smallest object that any spacecraft has ever orbited. The probe will extensively survey the asteroid before mission managers identify two possible sample sites. Sample collection slated for July 2020, with the spacecraft then heading back towards Earth before ejecting the sample return capsule for landing in the Utah desert in September 2023. Provisionally named 1999 RQ-36, and now formally catalogued as 10-1955 Bennu, the name of a mythological Egyptian bird. The half-kilometre-wide near-Earth asteroid is listed as a potentially hazardous object, with a 1 in 2700 chance of impacting the Earth between 2175 and 2199. Bennu is a C-type carbonaceous asteroid from the Apollo Group, a collection of Earth-crossing asteroids. On average, an asteroid with a diameter of about 500 metres, such as Bennu, is expected to impact the Earth about once every 130,000 years. A 2010 dynamical study predicted a series of eight potential Earth impacts by Bennu between 2169 and 2199. The cumulative probability of impact is dependent on the physical properties of Bennu. They were poorly known at the time, but were found not to exceed 0.071% for all eight encounters. The authors of that study recognised that an accurate assessment of Bennu's probability of Earth impact would require a detailed shape model, as well as additional observations, in order to determine the magnitude and direction of any Yakovsky effect. The Yakovsky effect is caused by sunlight warming the dayside surface of a rotating body such as an asteroid. As the asteroid revolves, the night side cools down, releasing the heat which acts as a sort of small thrust, exerting a small but real force that can change an asteroid's direction over time. The publication of the shape model and the astrometry based on radar observations made possible an improved estimate of the Yakovsky acceleration and a revised assessment of the impact probability. The current best assessment for the impact probability is a cumulative probability of about 0.037% between 2175 and 2196. If an impact with Earth were to occur, the expected kinetic energy associated with such a collision would be the equivalent of 1,200 megatons of TNT. Bennu will pass 750,000 kilometres above the Earth's surface on September 23, 2060, and this close approach will cause a divergence in Bennu's trajectory for its next close approach to Earth, which will occur on September the 25th, 2135. And that could be anywhere between 100,000 and 300,000 kilometres. And while there's no chance of an Earth impact in 2135, it will be close. However, that 2135 approach is crucial. Bennu may end up passing through a gravitational keyhole during its passage, which will create an impact scenario in a future encounter. On the 25th of September 2175, there's a 1 in 24,000 chance of an Earth impact. But the nominal 2175 approach in February is roughly expected to be at a distance of around 15 million kilometres. Bennu's most threatening trajectory for the Earth will be on the 24th of September 2196, when there's a 1 in 11,000 chance of a direct Earth impact. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a supermassive black hole almost as big as the one at the centre of the Milky Way in an ultra-compact dwarf galaxy just a fraction of the Milky Way size. Located some 60 million light-years away, the galaxy Fornax UCD3 is part of the Fornax Galaxy Cluster. It belongs to a very rare and unusual class of galaxies known as ultra-compact dwarfs. The discovery, reported in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, helps support the tidal origins hypothesis for ultra-compact dwarf galaxies. You see, the mass of these dwarf galaxies only reaches a few tens of millions of solar masses, and with radiuses typically less than 300 light-years. Now, by comparison, the Milky Way galaxy is between 1.2 and 1.9 trillion solar masses, and it's over 100,000 light-years across. This ratio between size and mass makes ultra-compact dwarf galaxies among the densest stellar systems in the universe. The supermassive black hole at the centre of Fornax UCD3 is about 3.5 million solar masses, corresponding to some 4% of the galaxy's total mass. 
In most galaxies, this ratio is a lot lower, at just 0.3%. To make their discovery, the authors used data collected by Symphony, the spectrograph for integral field observations in the near infrared. Symphony is installed on one of the European Southern Observatory's 8 meter VLTs, or Very Large Telescopes, in Chile. The spectra collected by Symphony allowed scientists to study stars near the galactic center, determining their motion compared to the overall galactic stellar population. The authors then used computer models to determine that the velocity dispersion in the galactic center could only be explained by a supermassive black hole some three and a half million times the mass of our Sun. This discovery marks only the fourth time that a supermassive black hole has been detected in an ultra-compact dwarf galaxy. The study's lead author, Anton Afanasiev, from the Lomonosov Moscow State University, says the discovery supports the tidal origin hypothesis for ultra-compact dwarfs. According to this hypothesis, an average-sized galaxy passes a bit too close to a more massive galaxy. As it does so, the gravitational tidal forces of the bigger galaxy rips most of the stars off the smaller companion. And the remaining compact galactic nucleus has become what we now call an ultra-compact dwarf. Afanasev now plans to search for black holes in more massive yet less dense compact elliptical galaxies to see if the same hypothesis also works for other galactic populations. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. And time now for another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Western and indigenous knowledge have converged to solve the mystery of the declining Melaleuca forests of northern Australia. Scientists from Sydney's Macquarie University worked closely with the Yolongu traditional owners who would express concern about the dieback of culturally significant coastal melaleuca or paperbark stands. Through their combined knowledge, researchers found that the plant decline is likely being caused by a combination of soil salinity and damage from feral animals. The authors say the findings reported in the Journal of Marine and Freshwater Research is ecologically important and a significant milestone in cross-cultural collaboration. Well, it's something many school teachers in Australia and the United States only dream about. But French education authorities have formally banned school kids using mobile phones in the class. Under the new rules, primary and junior school students are also banned from using tablets and smartwatches. Nearly 90% of French kids have mobile phones. Supporters of the new ban are hoping the move will limit the spread of violence and pornography among young children. However, the ban doesn't yet extend to senior high school students, those aged 15 to 18. Although local school administrations can introduce their own rules on electronic devices. There are growing concerns that the United Nations Cultural and Educational Organization, UNESCO, is about to turn its attention to the Dead Sea Scrolls. The problem is, in recent years, UNESCO has become mired in scientific controversy over decisions it's made which go against the scientific and archaeological evidence. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a large cache of mostly Hebrew writings and biblical texts from the Old Testament. They're believed to have been penned by members of a Jewish sect known as the Essenes from the time of the Second Temple and its immediate aftermath, when the lands of Israel and Judah were renamed Palestine by the Romans. The scrolls were discovered in caves at Qumran in the Judean desert near the Dead Sea between 1947 and 1956. The concerns surround evidence that UNESCO is allowing pro-Palestinian delegates to engage in a campaign of pushing an agenda of anti-Semitic revisionism of evidence relating to almost 4,000 years of Jewish history in Israel. The agency was accused of promoting fake history after it supported a Palestinian claim that Rachel's tomb and the Cave of the Patriarchs in the ancient city of Hebron were wholly Islamic sites, even though the tomb dates back to more than a thousand years before the Islamic religion. The decision was seen as a slap in the face for Jews, who believe Hebron was the birthplace of the Jewish people as it marks the tomb of the Jewish patriarch Abraham and was built by Jews. UNESCO also passed a resolution disregarding any Jewish ties to the holiest place in Judaism, the Western or Wailing Wall and the Temple Mount. More concerns of bias were then raised following UNESCO's revision of the historical and archaeological evidence over the origins of the old city of Jerusalem built by King David. The latest concerns come as archaeologists discover dozens of ancient coins with Jewish symbols on them in a large cave during excavations near the walls of the old city by the Temple Mount. The coins date from the last year of the Great Revolt against the Romans, which occurred around the year 67. Some of the coins also contain an inscription, 
for the liberation of Zion. A new study claims that most animals, including your family pets, tend to see the world far more blurry than what people do. The findings reported in the journal Trends in Ecology and Evolution indicate that humans see the world in far higher resolution than most animals. Compared with many animals, human eyes aren't especially adept at distinguishing colours or seeing in dim light. But by one measure at least, something called visual acuity, human eyes can see fine details that most animals can't. Scientists studied the visual acuity of roughly 600 species of insects, birds, mammals, fish and other animals. The study measured acuity in terms of cycles per degree, which is how many pairs of black and white parallel lines a species can discern within one degree of the field of vision, before they turn into a smear of grey. The limit of detail that human eyes can resolve is around 60 cycles per degree, which helps people make out road signs and recognise faces from afar. Chimpanzees and other primates can pick out similar fine patterns. A few birds of prey do better. For instance, the Australian wedge-tailed eagle can see 140 cycles per degree, more than twice the limit of human visual acuity. That's why eagles can spot something as small as a rabbit while flying thousands of feet above the ground. But apart from eagles, vultures and falcons, the results show that most birds see fewer than 30 cycles per degree, less than half as much detail as humans. The same goes for fish, whose visual acuity is also only about half as sharp as people. Believe it or not, humans can resolve four to seven times more detail than dogs and cats, and over a hundred times more than a mouse or a fruit fly. And it turns out most insects can't see more than one cycle. The scientific method involves observation, hypothesis, experimentation, analysis and conclusion. Science is all about critical thinking. It's a search for the truth. Don't just take someone's word for it. Test the claim. See if it's factual and stands up, or if it's nothing more than a great steaming pile of woo. See, that's what scepticism and evidence-based science is all about. It's a search for the truth. And remember, scientific facts don't care if you like them or not. Data dredging, or p-hacking, involves collecting lots and lots of information in a data set and then manipulating that information by making the random sample size either smaller or larger, or altering how long the study lasts, until some apparently statistically significant implications can be drawn from the research, even though there was no real underlying effect. Australian Skeptics President Aran Segev provides us with a skeptic's guide to p-hacking. P-hacking is a way of manipulating data in a scientific experiment that creates the impression of positive or meaningful results where none exist. To understand p-hacking, we first need to understand what p is. So p is used to indicate the probability that the result of an experiment was obtained by chance alone. For example, let's say we test some medication that works 10% of the time. And let's say we test it on 10 patients per experiment. If we repeat the experiment enough times, two things will happen. First of all, on average, we will get one patient getting better each time. That's on average. But in some of the repetitions, we will get zero or two or even three or four, maybe even five patients getting better. Because we have a small number of patients in each experiment, small deviations have a large impact on the results of the experiment. So if we have three cured patients in one experiment, we could think wrongly that the medication is 30% efficacious. In order to have confidence in the results of a specific experiment, we need to know what the probability that is that our result was obtained by pure chance. And that needs to be very small. That is what P is. Uh, in some sense, you could say that P is the probability that the results are not real. So we want it to be very, very small. Typical result for P in life sciences is 0.05 or 5%, which means that the probability is less than 1 in 20 that the results were obtained by chance. And of course, the smaller the P value, the more confident we can be that the results are real. Now, it's important to note that this means that an experiment that is replicated a hundred times could have positive results five times by complete chance. And that's why when we look at science, it's very important to look at the, all the body of evidence and not at individual studies. That, that is something that is not relevant just for a specific study, but into how we approach science in general. To calculate P correctly, it is extremely important that certain standards are adhered to. First of all, we have to have a hypothesis or question that is formulated before we look at the data. And then the statistical method of analysis is also defined before we look at the data. Without adhering to these principles, it is very easy to use the data in such a way that a low p-value is obtained even though the results are not real, or at least not representative. Uh, examples of p-hacking behaviors, be, for example, you could stop collecting data once p is smaller than 0.05. Or you could exclude, 
exclude certain data. For example, you could exclude very high data, or very low data, the extremes of the data to get a p-value uh, that's less than 0 0.05. Or you can make many different analyses of the same data and only report those where p is smaller than 0 0.05. And of course, the last one is a particularly common one. An important point about p-hacking is that scientists can do it without intending to deceive. They could simply not know any better, but the outcome is the same, unreliable and incorrect results that can cause immense harm. Why isn't p-hacking picked up in peer review? I think uh, mostly p-hacking isn't picked up in peer review because peer review until recently uh, was not designed to pick it up. One of the ways to uh, pick up p-hacking is by looking at all of the data. And that is something that was not done in the past. The amount of papers that are being published nowadays is so high that it's very difficult to look at the data in detail. And indeed, in the past, it was simply not customary for reviewers to look at the data from the experiment. They assumed that the analysis was honest and, uh, and that the results were correct. It is increasingly the case that, first of all, research is registered in advance. So, for example, in when medi most medications nowadays, uh, the research that leads to their being uh, uh, put into public consumption, uh, the research is registered in advance so that we know that even negative results will be published. We know what the experiment is going to be like, and the results are less likely to be uh, hacked. Would Fleischmann ponds and their cold fusion claims also be p-hacking? No, this was another type of, of error in uh, publishing, in, in scientific uh, publishing. Uh, what, uh, what they did in 1989 is they published a press release where they claimed that the experiment they conducted produced excess heat in a way that would only be explained by what we can now call cold fusion. Uh, such a momentous finding would typically be sent to a major scientific journal and go through a rigorous peer review. But in this case, the paper was, not only, it was only sent to the journal Nature the day after the press release and subsequent press conference. This is called a science by press release, and of course, it's really frowned upon. When scientists tried to replicate the results, they inevitably and invariably failed. And within 12 months, the Fleischmann and Pons experiment was completely discredited. Another interesting story of uh, poor science is the story of Jacques Menveniste. Uh, he was a French immunologist who, in 1988, published a paper that, if true, would show that the concept of hyperdilution, as used in homeopathy, is correct. Benveniste went on to claim that water retained the memory of the ingredients present in them prior to dilution, which on the face of it provides a mechanism for homeopathy to work. Of course, it raises all kinds of questions about the, you know, the ingredients, ingredients like dinosaur poo and things like that, but that's a separate question. Soon after the publication of the paper, the journal Nature sent a team to Benveniste's lab to investigate their protocols. Importantly, uh, the noted uh, skeptic James Randi was part of that team. He wrote a book later on called A Magician in the Lab. Being a magician and therefore an expert in deception, Randi made sure that no cheating was possible, even inadvertently. And the results subsequently turned from positive to negative. And finally, uh, we have the, probably the worst example, and that's the case of Andrew Wakefield, formerly a doctor and uh, no longer a doctor because he was stripped of his title. He was a respected doctor in, in 1998 when he published a paper that suggested a link between the MMR vaccine and autism. In time, that paper turned out to, to have been completely fraudulent. Uh, Wakefield was also found guilty of numerous ethics violations with respect to the paper. But uh, and due to these findings uh, about his research, Wakefield was stripped of his medical license and is largely shunned in the medical fraternity. In 2010, the journal Lancet, where the paper was published, retracted it. And that's actually a very important thing. Papers are very, very rarely retracted, even if they're wrong. They're only retracted if the journal where uh, they're published reaches the conclusion that they should never have been published in the first case. That's Iran Segev, president of Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast -coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter 
Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 